How you doing, everybody? Hi, Hans. Is it late up there, Hans, where, where you are? Hi, Neil and Junior and John, Tony. Oh, how you guys doing? Hey, Clyde. Great to see you. You know, you got a great beard, uh, Clyde. You got to keep that after, or is that just a pandemic look? <laughs> oh. Hey, Joe, Joseph, Rick. Hi, Rick. Abdul. Hi, Abdul. How are you? William Rizzo. Good to see you, Andrew. <laughs> okay. Um, what I wanted to talk about uh, today is something we started this morning. Um, hi, Marizo and Thomas. How you guys doing? Um, what I wanted to talk about uh, was sort of going the other way. We... The, the kind of things that get a lot of discussion are like, hi, Carlos, how you doing? Uh, the, the kind of constant force that gets a lot of discussion are things that are supposed to, uh, to provide it, but they're not a whole lot of them. Uh, Remontoire Galate, the uh, Fouzi and Chain, uh, parallel double barrels, what else, uh, any number of things that are supposed to provide constant force. Uh, hey, Kaz, how you doing, man? Uh, and so, <laughs> so anyway, so what I thought I, I'd talk about today, and to tell you the truth, I'm really not sure what the answer is. Hi, Javi. Uh, but the Mr. Grumby, how are you? What what I thought I'd start with is is to throw it out to you guys. Okay, here you have a watch movement. This is sort of my beater watch movement, and you've got your balance and all in your gear train and everything else in it that goes into a movement. And then on the front side, it's got the little uh, stems to put the hands on and so forth. But I was thinking, what if you said, okay, the, the very first thing that you need to have constant force in a watch would be what? Anybody want to come up with anything? I'll come up with something eventually, but I know you guys can. I mean, you all have watches. Uh, this is one that I think has great constant force, gravity. Gravity. Gravity is a constant force. <laughs> Try to think what effect now. I know that gravity has an effect because when you uh, test a watch for its, its ticking and so forth, you put it at different angles. And so the gravity will have, you can measure the effect that gravity has on it because you're really dealing with that. Uh, my Omega Aqua Terra has the 8900 movement with tw twin barrels. Okay, now, William, there are two kinds of twin barrels. Uh, one kind is the barrels are in parallel, and the other kind is their serial. The serial, what the serial twin barrels do is they simply extend the length of time your watch will run. Uh, basically, what happens is that as soon as one mainspring is finished, the other one kicks in and it'll give you more time. What barrels in parallel do, the, the, that has two mainsprings, the mainsprings are undoing at the same time, giving more force to the uh, gear train. And so you get a nice smooth, smoother, uh, ticking of the of the watt so to speak you get a smoother transfer of power that way at least that's the idea behind it uh so what you need to do william is find out does the omega aqua terra have serial uh double barrels or parallel hey donald good to see you gravity is not a force it's a non 
Elysian geometric. Okay, Carlos, I'll, I'll take your word for it. That's well, it's it's something like that. It has an effect on the watch. I think that's what um, that's what uh, Clyde meant. Uh, hey, PSK thirty one potential energy, the mainspring. There you go. Uh, proper lubricant, but not too much. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. You're right, though. Um, when I took my uh, watchmaking course, they have a they, they there was a picture that they showed of this uh, oil and lubricant uh, device, and it had um, lubricant dripping out of the lubricant device. And the guy teaching the course said, "You never see that." I mean, it's like that would be flooding it. Uh, what happens if you over lubricate a watch? You have to take the whole thing apart, dry it all off, clean it off, and then put it back together again. And so what you do is that you just, there's a very fine amount you have on it. I'll tell you something that's really interesting. If you have an ETA movement in your watch, uh, if you go to eta.ch and then go to, and then go find your movement, they'll give you an entire lubricating, um, tell you everything you need to know. There are different kinds of lubricants. You, some need light, some need heavier lubricants, but they have it all spelled out for you what the lubrication points are. It's really very helpful. Um, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't tried it yet, but I, that that's on my to-do list someday when I get really brave. Anyway, the matter of consideration would consider gravity as a force in a Newtonian way. There you go, Carlos. <laughs> Newton, boy. But isn't that, didn't, uh, in a Newtonian way, didn't they drop an Apple watch on, on Newton's head? <laughs> That's how we figured it out. Oh, okay. I'm get, getting silly. Um, hey, Nefarian, how you doing? Mark J, how's it going? Forbin, hi, Forbin. Don't get too lubricated with alcohol before. Yes, that's true. That's another good point. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's take a look. Carlos, I got a question for you. What would be another uh, one, since we're, we're setting gravity aside for now, what would be something else that would be an important thing uh, for uh, constant force in a watch? The most constant force is electromagnetism, been around since the beginning. Okay, that's another force that will... <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> You know, it, it's really funny. Um, resonance is actually a force to, to throw watches off. Um, if there is resonance next to a watch, it's doing something, and so is your watch. Uh, and what was his name? Javi, I think. Something like that. Uh, not not Javi, but Javin. Or, he was one of the early ones back back in Breguet's time. And he took uh, two um, pendulums on watches and set up resonance. And then later on, uh, you know, before F.P. Jorn did it, uh, Breguet had a, had a watch actually uh, that had resonance. He made three of them in his, uh, that was, and that was the idea was that if you have resonance within the watch, it will offset any from the outside. Okay. Uh, Mainspring. Okay, let's talk about the mainspring. The mainspring is obviously you want that to be a constant force. And what what would affect the constant force of a mainspring? The reason I ask that, if there's anything about the mainspring we should know for a constant pressure on the on the uh, wheel train, what would that be? Centrifugal force of the mainspring. I don't. Does this, does the mainspring really generate much centrifugal force? You know, I you know, I, I, I was wondering. The centrifugal force would pull it to the outer outer rim. I'm not sure of where that would come from, um, it, but if it did. I love the rim and toile. It makes it visually appealing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that too. You know, this is to me is that for some reason everybody jumped on the uh, tourbillon bandwagon, and uh, but they but they haven't jumped on the um, 
the people on the um, Remontoir Egalité. I mean, how, how come more watchmakers haven't done that? It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, Stephen Forsay told us that, and that's how come more of them haven't done it. But if, I mean, a, Remont uh, a Tourbillon is no easy task either. To me, it looks more difficult, but apparently the Remontoir is, the Egalité has more things involved. Okay, let's say a residence owner, uh, does it actually work? Yeah, I've got a residence working, you better it works. You know, this is something is that it, it does, it's not so much a residence work, it's a <coughs> physics works. And you can, there are all kinds of online experiments with residents that have nothing to do with watches, but it's sort of fun to watch because it's the same principle working elsewhere. I'd like to see experiments conducted in a vacuum with respect to F.P. John's resonance watch, okay? I tell you what, Joe, Joseph, do this. Go online, take a look at some of the general, the more general ones. Um, I know that some people think, well, let me see, if you did it in a vacuum, I guess you wouldn't uh, generate any kind of wind. Is that what it is? <laughs> but something something is happening with it. Uh, I, I did an experiment in one of the videos. I just, just did a simple one. I had a string across here. I had two strings, and each one of them had a, a bolt on the end for a weight. And I dropped them in off. Well, I dropped them in different times. And what resonance made them do was to align with each other. And it was really cool to watch that. And the same principle works with um, resident watches. It's, n it's not an easy thing to do, and there are not a lot of them. Uh, but it it does work. I mean, it, it, it's like, you know, people say, well, is it really a resonance or what? What is it? You know, some a mouse blowing on it? <laughs> I don't know what it is. Force of ever-releasing spring needs regulating so it comes to unwind all at once. Much as an electrical current, very good. Yeah, Forbin's, that's a good point. So what you're really talking about, uh, another thing that would be crucial to it is your escapement because your escapement is what releases or lets the power escape. Friction, yeah, fr uh, William, that's another one. Friction would affect it. And this is why you need lubricants. Uh, one of the things that... George Daniel said about the um, coaxial escapement, it reduces friction. And uh, in fact, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think you don't need any lubrication on, on those. Uh, those of you with an Omega watch uh, could let us know. I feel like I snuck into a lecture without doing the required reading. <laughs> oh, hey, Orange Head, how you doing? Would an automatic warn all... They have a constant force and a manual one. No, I don't think so. I, it, you know, one of the things about um, an automatic is that they seem to have anything but constant force because the different, you know, when you're looking at the, um, the oscillating weight, the uh, rotor moving, it depends on how you move. So if you're, you know, if you're, you know, walking around doing something, going from one office to another at work, and then you're back in your own office and you're just key, keyboarding on the computer. Those are different kinds of movements which would have different effects on your oscillation weight. <laughs> but we do not live in a vacuum, most, most of it. I try. I think, I think in the pandemic, we, we're all going for a vacuum. I like, the, you know, the boy in the bubble. Like, you know, maybe we all, we all ought to start living in bubbles. Uh Yeah, Carlos, you're right. That this is what, what I'm trying to do is sort of like is sort of a bad example of Occam's razor is trying to cut down until you know you can say, okay, what is the very what is the most basic thing that we put into a watch uh, to make sure that it it has a constant force of unwinding. I think you know the other thing too, and this is this is one we don't talk about very much at all is the teeth, uh, the gear teeth. 
Uh, one of the things that um, H. Moser at Company has are, they call them Moser teeth. And uh, I was looking at gear teeth for a while, and they're all different kinds of teeth. I had no idea. And how the teeth sort of come together uh, and how smooth it is will affect whether the, the power going through the um, gear crane is smooth or not. So that was another thing that, um, and yet another thing I like about Mosers. They have, they, they, they talk about the Moser teeth. <laughs> the truth is often stranger than fiction, said Popeye. Uh, I am not denying the existence of resin. I am skeptical about it being present in the strictest sense of F.P. Jordan's design. I want to see proof. So if you put it in a vacuum, how would that be more proof? I, I don't know. I, I've had it now for about, I don't know, three or four or five years, something like that. And all I know is that when I wind it up in the morning and uh, set the two second hands, at the end of the day, the, the two second hands are exactly uh, where they're both the same. And, and so, you know, that's one of the things that would be, I, I don't know what other kind of proof you want. It's, it's like, the, there are a lot of, um, I, I, I'm not saying, you know, you, Joseph, you're a flat earth guy or something, the earth is flat. Resonance doesn't work because some hack said it didn't work. Uh, I haven't seen any evidence that it doesn't work. Uh, and I've looked at it in terms of a lot of the different physics of it beyond the watch itself. Now, it is that, if you have two two pendulums, let me let me get my pen out. Um, I was doing drawings this morning. Okay, so you have, and this is Java Java in here, something like that. Anyway, so you take two pendulums, okay, like this. All right. And if you start swinging them independently, they will eventually, they will somehow start establishing resonance and they're swinging together. Okay. Now, a, a wheel, a balance wheel is essentially a pendulum. Okay. Except what you have if you look at each spoke on a wheel, think of it as a as a pendulum, okay? And if you if you think of it that way, I think it helps because what you have, you have. Uh, can you see that? There we go. What you have is that. And I'm going to put a. Um, let me get a red pencil out here. Okay, now at the bottom down there where the red dot is, now what happens with a, a balance wheel is that they go through uh, semi-oscillations. And I forgot the exact degrees, so, But they don't go all the way around like that. They go around one way, and then they go around the other way. Those are the semi-oscillations. An entire oscillation would go all the way around, but they never do they're like a pendulum, they're going back and forth. And if you if you consider a spoke like a, a pendulum, you'll see it going back and forth like that, except you have like, you have a series of four sequential pendulums going back and forth and having, that's how, that's how, that's how they generate um, resonance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Hans. How you doing? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, let's see. Abdul, our November lockdown looks like uh, will be extended to December as well. So I have enough back in here. <laughs> all right. Uh, 
Jr. Okay. England swings like a pendulum do. Uh, this is the art bit of watch art side. Yeah, I think, <laughs> wait a minute. I think it's a side part of watch art side. A uh, Mason performance in a vacuum will at least rule out acoustical resonance. Yeah. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, hey, Paul, how you doing? Um, okay, John, my old 100-year-old pocket watch Omega is worn due to uh, wear, no jewels uh, at that time. Material used was silver and later smalls were brass. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, the, I don't, what, re, what few uh, resonant watches there are, what, what they're trying to do is simply cancel out the other resonance. Okay. They generate resonance. And if you have something, well, let's say you got some, you know, something going on out here, you know, here's your watch, and then you got something going on out here that generates resonance. That has always been seen as a problem in in timekeeping. It's the outside resonance. Now, I don't know if, if it's acoustical or not, but um, that that was, it, it's sort of, sort of both seen as a problem, but um, Havanier, I think his name is, something like, J-A-V, something like that. His was his experiments worked with it uh, as a um, uh, something to offset it. Hi, Crappy. Um, okay, all right. Let's get some more ideas here that you have about what else we talked about. We talked about the stream. I mean the. Um, uh, the gear train, the smoothness of the unwinding uh, mainspring. Um, talk about resonance. What else? Uh, lubrication. What else? What else would there be that we could talk about? I mean, in terms of s relatively simple things. I, I think there is a whole, Carlos, you may know about this, this is the metallurgy of the, of the materials that make up the movement. Uh, certain metals, I think, will do better. If you have a, a piece of metal and it has impurities at one end and not at the other, that will set it in, in terms of some kind of imbalance and so who knows anything about metallurgy nefarian balance weights yeah joe um the maltese cross what does the maltese cross do i've seen it a lot and i've seen it explained but i'm trying to remember what it did how, how does the uh, maltese cross um help establish Constant force. Jules. John, yeah, Jules is a good one too. You know, now that the the, the interesting thing about Jules, now that they're man-made, they can be tweaked a lot more uh, than mined ones. Uh, if you go out and you dig up uh, you know, a, a ruby, uh, it's going to have lots of different kinds of things in it that aren't too helpful. You have to find one, just the right one. So, but with manufactured rubies, they can make them to just the size that they need, which is sort of interesting. Balance weights, yes. Okay, vibration per hour debate. You know, there's a good article in one of the um, what is it, a uh, quill and pad that uh, Ryan Schmidt did on. The and he's talking about different size um, balance wheels, and his conclusion was was that you can even any one of them out with more or less uh, frequency. And uh, I've said a number of times I prefer the lower frequency for a lot of reasons, and and I think that 
I think ones with lower frequency are a little harder to um, to regulate, to set them up just right. And uh, but once you get them set up, I think if like for example, if you like uh, carry boot and lantern, if you use those big balance wheels and you have the stability of the size of the balance wheel, then you can drop the size, the speed of the frequency. And, but to, to tweak it just right, I think, is, is where your skill comes in. On the other hand, you got to, you know, you know, four hertz zooming away, you could use a smaller one. And uh, you'll also get good, oh, let's say, smoothness out of it. The difference, of course, becomes, you know, which one is banging up the, <laughs> your watch quicker. Tribology. Oh, interesting. Okay. How about a Maltese Mift? I don't know what a Maltese Mift is. Fuzzy and Chain. Join late. Not sure if you mentioned it. Yeah, we did. It's the thing is with uh, we talked about this morning. We talked about a Fuzzy and Chain. The problem with the Fuzzy and Chain was that it um, they're really fat. <laughs> you have to have a fat one in it. Oh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see about getting some uh, Fuzzy and Chain movements. I I got a friend who's got. I think he bought a thousand of them. <laughs> he doesn't know. I don't know what he's gonna do with them because I know that he doesn't. So that'd be fun. Uh, to do something we want to, you know, get a hold of one. I, I bought a couple, um, I don't know why I bought them, but I decided that I should buy some um, regulator uh, movements, movements that were set up for a regulator. And I bought them, and they, and they come with all these, these little bitty, uh, you know, those little copper uh, hands they give you. <laughs> I, I wind them up and off it goes and it keeps, you know, very good time. I've got to figure out what I'm going to use for a, uh, for a dial. I mean, you try to find a dial. Not only is it hard to find a dial for a regulator style of uh, hands and stuff, but a small one, I don't know where they got that idea. It was, and I don't know what I, well, you know, I was even dumber why I bought them. Um, you can go on a whole other direction and think about how GS regulates with a spring drive. No, I don't think so. Not at all. That's you, you go with a spring drive, you're going to quartz. I don't want to go there. You can. Anybody can. Not me. Uh, and, and you get excellent, excellent, excellent uh, timekeeping that way. Um, but, you know, since we're sort of into an archaic type of, uh, of uh, watchmaking and watch collection. At least I am. I, I know, I, I, I was talking to somebody, he said, what do you have against silicon? You know, for years, <laughs> 30 years or so, I did nothing but work with silicon and uh, writing computer programs and so forth. And so I have nothing against them. In fact, right, you know, shortly before I retired, I was, you know, writing programs for um, iPhones and, you know, that's not much of that. But to me, that's just not interesting. I've got nothing against silicon. No, I just don't, not anything that I want to do anything with. You know, is sort of that. Um, yeah, I know it does that, uh, Nephron. I, I, I know how it works out. Uh, I've got nothing against it, though. I mean, some, if, if I needed a watch that didn't have a battery, and I needed to really excellent time. Uh, spring drive would probably be the way to go, but I'd rather, you know, take my easy diver that has excellent time uh, with a Roger Dubuis 14 movement and be happy with that, and be a little early or a little late. Uh, old lubricant shellac glue on themselves after a long period of time. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that, John. That's good to know, though. I mean, you know, they talk about um, that's the, the, the thing that's the thing about um, watchmaking, at least for me, it's hard. It really is. You got you got these little bitty things in there you got to deal with. And then you've got your um, 
uh, loop that you have, you know, there are different kinds of loop. I have loops that, you know, clip to my glasses. I have loops that they have a wire that goes around your head. I got loops that do all kinds of different stuff and you need them. And then, but phew, man, the concentration, these guys, I don't know. I, I think watchmaking can be terribly hard because you have to really concentrate. Uh, did you mention the GP silicon blade constant force escapement? How do you feel about the use of silicon there? Uh, is that GP? Is it uh, Jacques Pergo? Is that the one with the fan blades on the end? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I it's that I, I don't know. I suppose he could have done it with um, with metal as well. But. I'm not sure. Well, look, uh, I'm out of time, but this is something I tell you, I really would like to, uh, you know, hear your thoughts on this. You know, if we can, the idea, of course, is to find an inexpensive watch that has good constant force without having to spend a fortune. Okay, guys, I see. Have you ever opened your watches uh, just to photograph the inside? Um, yeah, I have. I opened up the back of my uh, Beauvais um, Mono Retro Pont, and it's got a really cool um, uh, Valjou movement. I think it was a Valjou 82, 84, something like that. And uh, that, that, and, you know, I think it was 70 years old or so, uh, you know, new old stock. Really fun to look at, but I, you know, about all I want to do is photograph it. One of the things I found out, and you can tell this if, if you're ever buying a, you know, sort of a vintage watch, if the regulator on it and the regulator on this one is, if it's shoved all the way over, that means that it's, they can't get it to run any slower or faster. And that's it sort of shot its wad. Okay, guys. Um, Take care. And oh, tomorrow, tomorrow, I think you, we're going to have a review of Watts Collection, a very, very interesting Watts Collection with several watches I've never heard of before and found to be fascinating. So, hope to see you then. They're affordable ones too. Take care.